Hello, welcome to my Black Powder Beginner's Guide. This is my fifth in the series, and this is looking at hand-to-hand -hand combat in the American Civil War. So, I am focusing on the American Civil War, and all my videos have covered the basic rules plus the American Civil War from Glory Hallelujah. I will be doing a video after this, which will focus on the Napoleonic Wars as well. So, you can take all the lessons from the basic Black Powder one and apply them to the Napoleonic Wars supplement. However, hand-to-hand -hand combat. So this represents in-game cold steel and close-up firefights. It can be the most brutal phase of black powder with because you're rolling the most dice. So if you remember back to your stat lines, hand-to-hand -hand combat score is, actually, is normally about six. There's two ways to get into close combat in black powder. You can either charge via your initiative or be ordered in. Now the Glory Hallelujah supplement has additional rules for this which makes it harder to get into close combat. That's because the American Civil War battles weren't so much charges as the units would get into firing range and adopt firing lines and blaze away at each other. So the game becomes about managing your firing lines rather than glorious charges. So if you wish to order a charge, you're at minus two to that command roll. So in this instance, see the enemy is really close. If my brigadier here wished to order a command for the Confederates to charge in, his leadership is 8. It'd be minus 1 because the enemy's in close proximity within 12. It's just further minus 2 because he's ordering a charge. So 8 minus 3 is 5. I'd require 5 or less on 2 dice to be able to complete this charge. And I've managed to roll 5. So the units would go in. If I'd rolled higher than 5, the units wouldn't obey the orders, stand where they were. They'd still be able to shoot in the shooting phase, but they pretty much refused to charge. I'm going to ignore all the other fights. We're just going to look at this fight here. So this unit has managed to charge in. Now the Union has several charge reactions. And bear in mind we're still in the movement phase at this point when you issue orders. So the charge reactions you can make are uh, uh, stand where you are, which is the default, closing fire, which if you get engaged to the front, you're pretty much always going to pick closing fire. If you're cavalry or horse artillery, you can evade, which allows you to move out of where the attack is. If you're cavalry, you're allowed to counter charge, if you're able to charge. Uh, Counter charge another cavalry, you engage in a melee. If you counter charge infantry, which charges yet, that's bad news for the infantry, because the infantry infantry lose a charge bonus and they're disordered. So there's no real stopping infantry charging cavalry, but bear in mind you're going to suffer some penalties for doing stuff. If you charge in the flank or the rear, you can turn to face as well. Now, another note about charging is when you issue your orders to charge, you don't need to be able to see your target with the unit you're ordering. So, for example, what you're going to charge could be on the other side of a hill. Your brigadier could issue an order like the 4th with Wisconsin to advance to the top of the hill and charge down at any enemies they see. Or the 5th Kentucky is to advance round the side of the village charging any enemy that presents themselves okay so in this instance my unit here was charged to the front so they're going to have some closing fire uh, closing fire if you remember you get plus one to the dice roll so instead of hitting on fours we're hitting on three so i'm going to roll my dice and i've got a six a five and a four so i've got three hits the six also disorders a charging unit this is pretty bad news for the confederates Confederate does get its morale save, and there's no other penalty, so it's a 4 plus for the morale save. And I've saved twice, and one has failed, so they've already taken a hit. Then we will be ready after the rest of the phases. When we get to the hand to hand combat, we'll look at this. So, hand to hand combat, six dice for regular units. So the Confederates. Hit on fours, just like shooting, with some modifiers. So dice roll modifiers, if you've charged, you're at plus one. If you're winning, and that means if you were locked in combat, whichever side won the previous round of combat gets plus one. 
In this case, that doesn't apply because there's already a F, because it's a charge this turn. If you're shaken or disordered, it's minus one. Skirmishers get minus one when engaged in hand-to-hand -hand combat. And if you're fighting and you're also engaged to your flank or your rear, you get minus one. So it'll be forced to hit, and then it will be plus one for charging, minus one for being disordered. So I'm going to roll these dice. So the Confederates, a super roller. They've got one miss, so we'll take that away. They've got five hits on the Confederate, on the Union. It'd be worthwhile hit, pointing out that sixes in hand-to-hand -hand combat don't cause disorder like they do in shooting. Also note that dice rolling is simultaneous, but generally we do the attackers or the people that's won the combat first. So what are the Union going to do? The Union are going to take five morale saves based on this. So they've got four plus, they've got no other modifier, so I'm going to roll my dice. And remarkably... They've got four successes there. The Union, the Confederate units got in amongst them, but the sergeants and the officers have pulled the U Union troops together and they've held the line. Now they get to fight back, so their hand-to-hand -hand value is six, so they get six dice. And they have none of the applicable modifiers, so it's forced to hit. So we we'll roll the dice, and these Union troops are well up for a fight, and they've just managed to roll six hits on the Confederates. So the Confederates' morale... We roll morale saves. Confederates, two saves, four fails. So that would knock them up to five. And they've taken four hits, a union none. Who's won combat? Then what you do is add up the number of hits and add in support. So we ignored everything else. In this case, it's four hits versus no hits. The union of one handily. Now I've mentioned supports there. I'm gonna show you what supports look like. If this was a fight here, supports are, you, you can claim supports, units that are unengaged to your flanks within six or to your rear within six. So in this instance, just looking at support, the Union unit has the artillery battery for plus one support and this regiment here for plus two support. The Confederates can claim plus one support from this unit here. You can claim a maximum of plus three support and only plus one from each one of quarter. So if we had say, a battery here and another unit directly behind, we could claim one, but we couldn't claim both. And supports directly add to the number that you've scored in combat. So if you've scored four hits and you've got two supports like this, you would score six. The Confederates scored none on the Union, claiming one support. So they'd score one in total. Six minus one, we would say the Union has won by five. Once you start fig factoring out who's one or who, who's not this winners don't need to take morale tests losers do need to take morale tests say morale should actually use a phrase break tests and this could mean that a loser is taken off the field falls back it or is just locked in combat now on a draw where both sides have scored three for example through hits and support both units are locked in combat unless one is shaken, in which case the unit which is shaken needs to take a morale test. Now what I'm going to do is an example of a more involved hand-to-hand -hand combat phase. So this time the full Confederate Brigade has moved up. Confederates are going to charge in. Now support, supports are really simple. And the advantage with support should always go to a canny attacker. Because an attacker should be able to determine which, where they're going to go in to fight that time and stack up the supports in their favour. So for example... If I wanted to get maximum support on this battle line, I 
the other thing I should say with supports is if you're engaged in close hand to hand combat, you can't offer supports. So we've passed our order to charge in. So if I was actually after my best use of supports here, I'd maybe try and move this unit to attack here, that unit to move support in the flank, and that unit to support in the rear. In which case I'd be getting plus two support, and the union would only be claiming plus one support from this unit here. The artillery battery would be too far away to support. I'm going to look at a few more examples after this, but we're going to see what a few bigger engagements look like. So the Confederate Brigade goes in. We've managed to roll out five or less. The order goes in for the front right line to charge the units in front of them. The rear units come up. Now I've got a choice where this would support. If we moved here, my unit will get plus one. There's no support for the Union. If it moved here, Confederate unit will get plus one. The Union unit will get plus one. So the supports will cancel each other out. So I would put it here. The other thing to think about supports is if your unit, which is engaged in hand-to-hand -hand combat, is forced to retreat, if it retreats and has to stop on the unit that's supporting it, it would get wiped out. So you're best to leave enough space for a move to go back. So the retreating unit isn't ending up getting wiped out by enemy units. More of which when we talk about break tests. So let's see how this combat would resolve. So we'll start off with over here, closing fire, Union rolls three, disorders the Confederates and scores two, three hits because it gets plus one to hit, so it's threes instead of fours. Confederates, terrible group of saves, and that becomes shaken already. In the middle of closing fire, it doesn't cause shaken, it's just two hits to the Confederates, and the Confederates have rolled two saves. So let's go start working out some hand-to-hand -hand combat. So we'll do the fight over here. So the Confederate unit. Normally hits on fours, plus one for charging threes. It is disordered. It's disordered or shaken. So it goes back to four. I'm going to roll my dice. And I've got three hits. Union takes their morale saves. That's got two saves, so the Union takes one hit. The Union's hand to hand combat goes back, and that's straight fours because there's no other modifiers affecting them. And they've got three hits there. Remember what I said about sixes in hand to hand combat don't cause disorder. And the Confederates, they're looking to take their morale saves. They save one and take another two. So then we're all pushes to five. So who's won that combat? There's no supports like we said before. Confederates scored one hit. Union scored two. Union have, have won that fight by one. We would then take break tests. Like I say, more of later in the video. In the next video. So the, the fight over here. The Confederates this time, they've gone in and they're not disordered. So they get normal to hit fours plus one for charging which takes it to threes and they've managed to get five hits on the union union take their morale saves and it's a basic four so the union there take three stamina losses union fight back Union have the six dice for the hand to hand combat value. And they hit on fours, so I'll roll my dice, and they've scored three hits on the Union there, uh, on the Confederacy there, and the Confederacy kicks their saves, and they've had three fails as well. So, what happens here? The Union 
caused three hits and they've got one support for four. Confederacy scored three hits and they've got one support for four. It's a draw. So normally that would mean both units are locked in combat, but because they're now both shaken, both units would have to take a break test when you're shaken in a draw. Not a great attack by the Confederacy there. So what I'm going to do is show you a few more unusual things that can crop up in combat. So first one I want to point out is closing fire from artillery. Closing fire and artillery, normally the artillery has three, four, five dice at close range when they close and fire. So this confederate unit closes here. So the artillery unit, it's three, it's three guns, <coughs> excuse me, three models which represents a six gun battery. So we're going to uh, more parrots than smooth wars in that one. So we'll give them four dice. Closing fire hits on threes. We've managed to get three hits there on the Confederacy. Now artillery saves at close range are at minus two. So instead of a four, the Confederates have a six to save. They've taken three hits. Now any unit taking an artillery hit for closing fire needs to take an immediate break test. So unless you can help it or you're pretty sure you can ram it home, charging artillery is an issue. However, if you do manage to attack an artillery piece, looking at this here, you'd expect them to get plus one, but artillery can never get support. Neither can skirmishes, if you engage skirmishes in combat. Uh, units garrisoning a building cannot be supported. A unit engaged the side of rear cannot be supported. A unit cannot be support if an engagement is happening within six inches of the quarter the support is coming from. So in that instance, would be something like if there was, we have to imagine that was a regular infantry unit. Normally, this unit would be offering, would be able to offer support to this unit. Imagine that's infantry, not artillery. But because there's a fight happening there, that unit couldn't offer support there. But that unit could obviously offer the support to the front. And units engaged, uh, units that are engaged, as I've discussed, in March Column or Limbered Artillery cannot support. Another thing is when you're fighting, generally it's one unit versus one unit. And you cannot engage two units, two units front, even if there was a bit of space to do so. What you normally do is sugar units so they're lined up evenly. However, a unit may be engaged to the front and to the side. So in this case, Confederacy is engaged to the front and a Union unit slams in to its flank. So what happens here? So the Confederate unit still has its six dice. Because it's engaged to the flank, it's minus one to hit, so it becomes five to hit. Confederates also have a choice of where they want to deliver their attacks. Half the attacks have to go to the front, and the other half, they have a choice of whether to put it to the flank unit or to the front unit. The choice is there. Generally, I try and maximize my attacks on one unit. In this situation, this unit is probably going to take more casualties and break. I'd rather try and do a bit more lasting damage to one unit than a little bit of damage to, to other units. Now the other thing is, once you've won a combat, if your enemy breaks, the enemy breaks, there's a chance it can be just taken off the field. The enemy might be forced to fall back 
this orderly retreat. Then you have a choice, whichever suits your tactical situation best for you. You can stand where you are, you can advance again on the, on the enemy that's fallen back. In which case, next round of combat, you would get the bonus for winning the fight. You could fall back yourself. Perhaps you've been caught out, maybe the rest of your battle lines fallen back around you, you may decide to fall back yourself. The other thing you, you may want to do, if you, especially if your enemy is being destroyed, is you can uh, take one move forward yourself, and it's called an advanced move. Or if there's another enemy unit behind this one, so imagine in this situation, the Confederate unit's been beaten in combat, well, four less on the break test has been removed from the field. This unit then could advance into the unit behind. The sweeping advance and charge move. There's also one other thing to really consider with hand-to-hand -hand combat. And it comes back to getting your units in hand, into hand-to-hand -hand combat. I'll cover this more fully with the commanders which will appear in my next video is as a follow me order so said so before so like minus two for example to charge in however there's a follow me in which case the brigadier joins the unit passes a morale test on its normal dice roll which would be an eight or less for this and the follow me order would allow you up to three moves, but only with one regiment. So basically it allows you to get one unit in on a eight or less instead of that five or less off or six or less. There's also some special rules, for example, uppity, which I'm going to cover in the special rules section, which instead of minus two to get into hand-to-hand -hand combat, you're more wanting to get in hand-to-hand -hand combat and you'll be at plus one. So there you have hand-to-hand -hand combat. Much more harder to get into during the American Civil War period than other periods covered in the Black Powder eras. And like I say, that's to represent Glory Hallelujah gives you the sensation of managing that firing line Combat can be very brutal and the supports really do matter and managing your supports are key to getting the most out of the close combat phase. If you've got any questions, as always, stick them in the comments section. If you've liked what you've seen, do subscribe because it shows me I'm doing a good job and you'll also be able to catch up with the rest of the videos. I say I've got three more in this series coming up, which is... Break test, shaken units and broken units. Another one which is commanders, special rules and the role of cavalry. And also beginner's guide to black powder, looking at the Napoleonic period. That's the period I've played most with black powder. But like I say, any questions you do have, I'm happy to chat. Other than that, that's goodbye from me. I hope you have a great time on the tabletop. Goodbye.